Yo, Dietrich Labbers, what's poppin'? It's time to solve the Dirac equation for plane waves. And you may wonder why. Well, they're useful for a number of different things. In fact, they're useful for enough different things that I decided making an independent video about it is worth it. One of the interesting things that I'm planning on using them for is in the quantization of the free Dirac field. Of course, you may remember from my previous videos on quantizing free fields, specifically real and complex scalar fields, you need plane wave solutions to the equations of motion in order to proceed with the quantization. Now, in the scalar field case, the plane wave solutions are trivial enough that I just wrote them down. I didn't bother making a separate video on deriving them. They're too simple. But the ones for the Dirac equation are complicated enough that it's actually worth making a separate video explaining them, especially given their general usefulness. So that's what this video is. I simply show you how to solve the free Dirac equation for plane wave solutions. So here follows the math section where I actually show you the process itself. Of course, if we want to solve the Dirac equation, we have to write it down first. So in natural units, which I will be using in this video, this is the Dirac equation we expect that there will be both positive and negative frequency plane wave solutions to this equation. Additionally, we expect those two different types of solutions to have somewhat different forms. So we're going to treat them as separate cases. Of course, also, because these are plane waves, we expect them to have a phase factor like this multiplying them, where the momentum 4 vector in this problem involves a time component that's related to the mass of the field and the spatial components of the momentum vector via the standard relativistic energy momentum mass relation. But because the psi field is a column vector and the operator applied to it is a matrix, we expect that there's going to be some probably momentum dependent factor in front here that will give it that column vector character and allow it to solve, in a sense, the matrix part of the equation. And as a result, we will take these two as our positive and negative frequency ansatzes respectively. Plugging these in gives us this equation for this u of p vector and this equation for this v of p vector. So then the goal is to solve these equations, which are no longer differential equations for these u of p and v of p vectors. Our approach will be to find convenient forms for the solutions to the rest frame case first, and then from there we'll attack the momentum dependent case, the general case. In the rest frame, these equations collapse down to these. Now we can't go any farther without picking a particular representation for the gamma matrices. And the standard one to use here is the Dirac representation, which is given here. With this representation, we find that these operators on these vectors we're trying to solve for simplify down to this, which makes it immediately clear that there are two linearly independent solutions to each of these equations, which can be simply expressed in this way. Of course, anything proportional to these solutions also works. The particular ones shown here were selected because they are the simplest. A Latin index will be used to denote which of the two solutions it is, where R and S can take on the values of 1 or 2 depending on which ones we're using. Now one can use the Lorentz invariance of these two products, implied by the Lorentz invariance of this quantity, to arrive at normalization conditions satisfied by the particular momentum generalizations of the above rest frame solutions, simply by computing them for the rest frame case. Basically, the rest frame case is true generally because of Lorentz invariance. Specifically, we find by trivially inserting these values into these relations that this is true, and because of the Lorentz invariance of these quantities, it's true for arbitrary momentum if we are using the momentum-dependent generalization of specifically this selection of solutions here, which we made, again, not because they're the only ones, but just because they're the most simple. So then we want momentum-dependent solutions that in the rest frame simplify down to this and therefore satisfy these normalization conditions. Therefore, when we do find momentum-dependent solutions, we'll want to normalize them to these normalization conditions. In fact, it was studying the rest frame case and finding these simplest solutions in the associated normalization conditions that was the reason for studying that case first. Also, we find these two relations, but they're less important for this particular problem. But I still stated them because they complete the set. Now let's find some arbitrary momentum solutions. And then once we find the arbitrary momentum solutions, we can normalize them 
to match these conditions and to, in the rest frame case, simplify down to these. One can easily find arbitrary momentum dependent solutions if we recognize this identity here and this identity here. Now, the proof of this identity is very similar to this one, so I only bothered to write out the proof of this one. So if we multiply this through, we arrive here, and we can factor out these momentum vectors there, and then we can recognize due to symmetry that we can rewrite this as an anti-commutator, and that the anti-commutator of gamma matrices simply equals twice the metric, so then we have just a dot product there, but that of course equals the mass, so then it goes to zero. And the other one works essentially identically. So with these identities in mind, we realize that we can write solutions to the equations we were trying to solve up here that are momentum dependent simply by multiplying these rest frame spinners by these two factors. We find that if we plug these into the equations we're trying to solve, we just arrive at these rest frame spinners multiplied by factors like these. This provides us with two linearly independent solutions for arbitrary momentum to the respective positive and negative frequency equations. They, however, do not reduce exactly to the simple rest frame solutions given above, and they do not satisfy the associated normalization conditions. As I said, we were going to find the arbitrary momentum solution and then normalize them to match the normalization conditions in the rest frame case that we studied previously and specifically selected because it was the simplest and most elegant. Applying the standard normalization gives these results. This is the standard normalization that yields agreeance with the rest frame case that we selected previously. This answer solves the Dirac equation and reduces to the above rest frame solutions, so the positive and negative frequency plane wave solutions to the Dirac equation can be found simply by plugging these values we've found for these momentum-dependent spinners back into the original ansatzes, which gives us these final beautiful results. So now you've seen the technical details of actually solving the Dirac equation for plane waves. You may have seen these solutions before. Hopefully this gives you a clear idea of one way of deriving them. Of course, another way is just to apply a Lorentz boost to the rest frame case, but that's uh, a bit less straightforward. This was a very easy way to do it, and it works just as well, so I figure I ought to show you that one. Personally, I think non-trivial exact solutions of any type to a famous partial differential equation, especially one of great physical significance, is really satisfying and pretty. So I really enjoyed doing the math in this video. I hope you enjoyed watching. Please like and subscribe. Dietrich out.